we have <laughs> we have no idea what we're doing here, do we? No, not even a little bit. Greetings and welcome to Reckoned Opinions. We've got pop culture top 10 lists. We have a poofy chair. My name is Adam and I will be your guide today as we charge headlong into part eight of our ongoing series, ranking every single song to hit number one on the modern rock charts in the 1990s, ranking them worst to first, 145 all the way up to number one. If you are a returner and especially if you're one of our new subscribers, Welcome back. If you are first timer here, uh, welcome aboard. Hope you like what you see. There's uh, like and subscribe buttons down there. You know how they work. Uh, I will put links to all the previous episodes. We got seven prior to this one. They're going to be down there in the description along with a link to the playlist. And I didn't script anything past that. It occurs to me that maybe I should have uh, should have read something down there. So um, credits. Faith in Today, today, we reach, nay, we cross the halfway point of this list. I could cry right here in the puffy chair. This has been a very big project. It's been a lot of time, a lot of work put into it, and we're finally starting to get to some of the stuff that I have been waiting since day one to talk about. I am incredibly excited. I'm glad you're here with me. Uh, let's get into it. Number 75. So when you're talking about career trajectories of the really big name artists, not the ones that had a couple hits and had some success at the time, but the ones who, at least when they were big, were very big. You mentioned their name and that meant something. Um, that career path can take a lot of different shapes. It could be slow building, just gradually growing their audience until they're way up here. It could be that they just have sudden success, just stumble onto it for some reason, and then maybe a long decline as, uh, as they lose momentum. And then there are those that are... Um, I spend a lot of time on this show ranting about one-hit wonders that aren't actually one-hit wonders. And on that count, I think Sinead O'Connor qualifies. The world as a whole seems to have forgotten about everything other than nothing compares to you. But I think she represents something even rarer. She's not just falsely accused of being a one-hit wonder, she's falsely accused of being a one-flop wonder. Okay, for those of you who weren't there, Yes, Sinead O'Connor was that big, for a little while anyway, and she fell that far and that hard. But people tend to remember it as being the result of one single decision. Everybody remembers the SNL tearing up the Pope's photo incident. Fight the real enemy! But what they don't remember is that she had been working to torpedo her career for a while at that point. She'd already canceled at one venue because they played the Star Spangled Banner before shows and Frank Sinatra threatened to kick her ass, which is really the sort of thing you need to get a merit badge for. The first time she signed on for SNL, she didn't go on because Andrew Dice Clay was the host and she refused. And when she did go on SNL, it was to promote Am I Not Your Girl, which was a collection of orchestral standards. That's the kind of move that you do when you're ready for a Vegas residency, not as the follow-up to your breakthrough album. So when she got booed off the stage at a tribute concert, it was for a long, focused campaign against her own career. Shanid was someone who did not know what to do with her own fame, and that was largely because she kept her music and her public persona really close to the vest, which is what made that album, I Do Not Want What I Have It Got, so wonderful but it is also at least one or two of the problems with this particular song. If your memory of her work begins and ends with nothing compares to you, then the rocking out aspect might startle you a little bit. 
It's easy to forget that that's where she started out. I mean, you don't shave your head and strap on some stompy boots if you're planning on doing a bunch of Carpenter's covers, if you know what I mean. The band is laying down a solid concrete foundation on this one, all tugboat rhythms and animal print guitar posturing. Meanwhile, Sinead whips out some vocal flourishes that if Dolores or Reardon were doing them, I'd be skipping dessert and calling for the check. But in this case, she actually makes it work for her. The band does a lot of the heavy lifting here, tonally speaking, because Sinead's vocal style does not change, ever. You know, it's ballad or banger, she is giving it all her all, and uh, everything has the same importance. She does not want to waste our time. And I think that's one of her strengths, because it means that she's invested in what she's doing. But it's one thing if your earnestness level is a 6 out of 10, it's another when it's a constant 14. Sinead has the same problem that John Lennon often had, of letting it all hang out a little too much, until things like skin conditions and TV-inappropriate body hair come on display. That's the thing about specificity. Ironically, specifics can make a song more relatable. We may not have had the artist's exact experience, but there's still that spark of recognition. Go too far in that direction, however, and everything slings back to being all about you. And that's a line that Sinead sometimes finds herself on the wrong side of. Not that it's all bad, mind you. She's got that killer line, how can I possibly know what I want when I was only 21? It blows my squishy little brain to know that she released this when she was 23. That's the sort of thing I didn't figure out until after I had reliable health care. But from there, the song drifts from confession to exhibitionism, turning into a Facebook post that she really should consider friends locking. I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got is a phenomenal album. She was god tier for that short period of time for a very good reason. And I love it when she decides to finally rock out. She doesn't do that much of it on this album, so this little moment is appreciated. You go back to her first album, The Lion and Cobra, there's a lot more of that. So I was very glad to hear it here. But it's not exactly what I'd call fun. I mean, she's rocking out because her dander is up, and I'm here for it. I'm here for her. I'm here for this. But I'm really looking forward to coffee after the show. Sinead O'Connor never completely went away, really. The audience has gotten smaller, but the material's still good. And really, she deserves to be remembered for more than one song and one questionable decision. A decent mid-tempo album track is worth more than a basketful of hot mic opinions. So I will go on record as saying that Sinead is overdue for a second chance. But I really don't think so. The Emperor's new clothes. I remember clearly the first time I heard this song. Uh, it was in the car, uh, local college radio. The song played, listened to it. The DJ came on, announced that the new album was out and said that he really liked it the first time he heard it when it was called In Utero. Okay, pal, first of all, you can bite my Warm sun, feed me up the word derivative is like the word sellout, in that I really want to strap it to a cinder block and chuck it into the East River like a mob informant. In an era when authenticity was king, derivative got used by everybody to dismiss anyone they felt superior to. And just about everybody in the music scene got hit with it at one point or another, right down to the genres themselves. Grunge is just classic rock, they'd say, or post-grunge is grunge light. And that's before we even get into the particulars. You like Stone Temple Pilots? You mean that Pearl Jam rip-off act? How can you listen to Tori Amos? She's not doing anything that Kate Bush wasn't doing in the 80s. Elastica? Psh, have they sent Wire their royalty checks yet? Good lord. And yeah, I thought the in utero joke was funny at the time, but in the decades since I've had time to ask myself why. And I'm not sure I like the answer. All music is derivative. You know, we like to pretend that it's not. But it is. There, there is no music that's, you know, just spewed into being, like uh, Athena being birthed out of uh, Zeus's forehead. It's like everything is a result of what came before. If somebody ever did come up with something that was completely not derivative of anything, we wouldn't process it as music. Nirvana was great, at least in part, because Kurt Cobain loved the Beatles and the Stooges and the Raincoats and the Shags, and he brought all of that with him to create what he created. 
So this isn't a question of, is it derivative? It is. It's a question of, does it derive from good material and does it create good material out of it? That is a big question. Bush got slapped with the derivative label extra hard, partly because, let's face it, Gavin Rossdale is so pretty. Let's just leave the Rolling Stone cover on the screen for a few seconds. That was for my wife. You're welcome, Andrea. Love you. But it's also because Bush in some ways were the poster kids for post-grunge, a genre that's derivative by definition. It's right there in the name. The main strand of musical DNA here is that patented Pixies quiet verse loud chorus dynamic shift, the same primordial soup that the first grunge amphibians crawled their way out of. Here, Bush tries to see just how far into the red they can bury that particular trope meter, and as a result, the verses pull so far back they sometimes lose track of where they were going, showing the sort of dissonance that spells out why you don't drop acid right before the gig. Like I said before, all music, all art really, is the sum total of its own influences. It's not the what, it's the how. And so the golden rule becomes, if you're going to steal, steal from the best. You know, if you're going to give us what we know, give us what we like. And you can accuse Bush all you want of succumbing to basic populism, but ask yourself, why was it popular in the first place? Look, people, I'm not a saint. I might not use derivative as an insult, but that mindset does affect how I listen to music. Swallowed is a perfectly serviceable, perfectly enjoyable Bush song. But right now I'm asking what it has that other songs don't, and the answer is not a whole lot. That's not a slur on the song or a slur on the band. But we're far enough into this countdown that just coasting isn't going to cut it. I need a prize in my Cracker Jacks box. We do a lot of talking about greatness, but I don't feel like we do enough talking about goodness. Greatness changes the world. Goodness works hard and works well within the parameters of the old one, and there is nothing wrong with that. Uh, Swallow doesn't set the sky ablaze, it doesn't kick in any doors, but I respect it for what it is, and I respect them for what they did, you know, back when they were called Candlebox. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I shouldn't, that's, it was a joke, I didn't mean that, really, sorry. <laughs> we made it. We actually made it. This song right here is the exact halfway point of the list. If you're doing the math, 72 songs behind it, 72 songs in front of it, we're, we, we've reached the middle, baby. I am, I am ecstatic. I want to raise banners and, uh, and try to forget the fact that we are dead in the middle of the road. Um, if you had handed me the list of songs and without knowing the ranking and asked me to figure out which one was in the exact middle, I could have picked this right out of the lineup. I kind of feel like I should apologize for calling this middle of the road. I mean, Fastball had eight albums, they must be doing something right. But let's be honest with ourselves. We're talking about a number one hit that comes saddled with number 34 hit energy. Even in the days of Clear Channel trying to homogenize everything as much as humanly possible, where the devil did this song get all its momentum from? You know, here in the middle of the pack, I sometimes struggle to find interesting things to say about a song. And there's a lot of ways that I can tackle that. I can, I can go for the personal angle. I can um, take a historical look at it, make a comparison to something else out there. And I, 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 I had nothing. I, this was a blank page in my notebook for like several days. I asked my friend Brendan, you know, can you think of something interesting to say about fastball? And what I got was, Eventually, after much thinking, he came up with the phrase secretary rock, and I think that's perfect because this is music for the same people who kept the Ross and Rachel will they or won't they plotline going for eight goddamn seasons. You know, it's just right down the middle. And so here we are. This is a song whose most interesting trait is that it's not interesting at all. Or is it? 
first of all, it's not a bad song. I did put 72 songs below it on this countdown, after all. Secondly, when you pick it apart musically, it does take a few chances. Those verses, for example, aren't pop, but tango. Replace those guitars with a violin and concertina, and you have yourself a smoldering, rose-in-the-teeth kind of moment. But then when it gets to the chorus, it rapidly jumps over to Jan and Dean Chevy convertible pop, like a sock hop for the Furby and Butterfly Clips crowd. Third, the lyrics are not the same old, same old clearance rack stuff. The Way is based on the true story of Leela and Raymond Howard, an elderly couple, she with Alzheimer's, he with recent brain surgery, who wandered off course on their way to a festival and were found dead together several weeks later away from their car. Fastball takes that sad tale and turns it into a transcendent one, about a couple finding themselves done with this stupid corporeal world and wanting to go find something better. So let's get back to the original thesis here. This is a number one alternative hit. There's nothing about this song that says number one or alternative. This is a normie song from a normie band. And this one hit number one when there were so many other normie bands with normie songs that did not hit number one. I am not naming any names on that. But all digressions aside, no one's more surprised by this than Fastball. Uh, I've heard interviews with these people and the first album sold something like 5,000 copies and so their reaction was, okay, we're gonna record one more album and then we're done and then we can break up. And then this happens and it's like accidentally winging the game while you're looking for the off button so you can rage quit. I think the song reached the heights that it reached because Fastball has a base level of true competence. The song might be average, but they nailed it on the execution. Plus, you know, it's catchy as hell. So on consideration, it deserved to be number one, but on this particular list, the middle is exactly where it belongs. There's not enough greatness for the top half, not enough awfulness for the bottom. And so, here we are. Anyone can see the road that they walk on. So there you have it, halfway point. It is all uphill from here. It actually downhill from here. I mean, it's uphill because the songs are getting better, but downhill because the numbers are getting sm Nobody cares. Okay, we're moving on. It is so weird that Lilith Fair was even a thing. Lilith Fair was created by Sarah McLaughlin at a time when bookers refused to put two women on the same bill because of cooties, I guess. The festival was a success, but then the word Lilith became a description all unto itself. Like somehow female was a genre. I mean, it's not like we had a dude fair back in the 90s. Or rather, we did. We called it the Warp Tour, but that's neither here nor there. From the very beginning, Lilith Fair invited a wide variety of artists. They brought in everyone from The Pretenders, to Emmylou Harris, to even Queen Latifah. But when you hear the name Lilith, you automatically conjure up that style. You know, acoustic, singer-songwriter, Birkenstocks, no foam lattes. Like it or not, there definitely is a Lilith brand. It's not like this style spontaneously combusted into being right there on the tour bus. I mean, you could trace this back at least to Joni Mitchell, probably back to the folk revival of the early 60s. Um, but even if you don't want to go that far back... Have you ever met someone who is exactly your type just before you or they were moving out of town? That was 10,000 Maniacs for me. They were big when I was in college, but I didn't really find them until after they'd broken up and I'd moved on. But really, let's get down to it. We're talking about lead singer Natalie Merchant. This is her show, her energy, her Lilithiness, if you will. I actually attended Lilith Fair back in 98 at one of the shows that Natalie was performing at. And I remember exactly nothing about her set whatsoever. What I do remember is when Bonnie Raitt was playing and Natalie decided to spontaneously come on stage for some uninhibited dancing during one of the songs. 
And that is when my partner leaned over to me and whispered, Natalie's a little weird. Whatever put that dance in her feet that day is what makes this song go. The joie de vie in lines like, you'll know it's true that you are blessed and lucky. It's like Christian music for secular humanists. The video does a good job of capturing that as well. She's dancing on an Art Deco gargoyle like the ones hanging on the Chrysler building. It's a moment of exultation, of surrender, heedless of all danger. Of course, she's not actually dancing on the Chrysler building because that's really frickin' dangerous. Although apparently nobody told Matt Johnson from the the because... Good lord, somebody tell him to stop that. Yeah, I can't watch. It is really difficult for me to slot this song into the Google Calendar of my life experiences because it doesn't seem to belong to any particular time and certainly not the time that it came out because it came out in 92. That was about two years too late for the previous wave of folk pop. It was two years too early for the one that was coming up. It's like this was the song that was holding the place in the ticket line while the rest of the genre stepped out for a smoke or something. The sound of These Are Days has the confidence of a band with a decade together under their belts. Everyone knows what everyone else is bringing to the table. You've got those honeydew harmonies you can sip like a mimosa, and that guitar shimmer that Roger McGuinn doesn't even remember lending out. It's all solid, but it escapes my notice a little too much. I like it when I'm looking at it, but it doesn't give me much reason to look. I think if I had gotten into 10,000 Maniacs back in college, this would probably be higher, because this is the sort of song they gets buoyed by nostalgia, but as it stands, I feel like I never got properly introduced. Like a, like somebody who goes to all the parties but you never actually have a conversation with. And you combine that with its sort of laconic way of the world and it just never had enough philosophy for me to have an opinion on it. I do appreciate the hopeful energy behind it, so I'll look on it kindly for that. Because if dancing freely is weird, then normal really has to go. As a pop culture critic on YouTube, it is part of my job description that sometimes I have to be an asshole. And sometimes I just don't have it in me. In this countdown, we have already scrawled the history of the long, dark tea time of what passed for alternative in the late 90s, both in general and as it pertains to Sugar Ray. And Fly certainly falls in that zone and all that that implies. And yet as I record this, there's this voice in the back of my head saying, don't pick on Fly, you're being a stupid meanie pants. And that voice, by the way, is me. Every year, the UK makes a big deal about the Christmas number one. Whatever song is at the top of the charts on Christmas Day. The US doesn't have that, but we do have the Song of the Summer, which is very ill-defined, and it's not clear as to who's the arbiter or what is going to get that title, but it just means a summery hit whatever that means, a big summary hit, usually some trifle of pop candy floss. It does not mean something off the modern rock charts, but if you did, if you were forced to pull something out of the alt-rock potato sack and make that the hit of the summer, it could very well be this, because Fly is one pool noodle short of a Father's Day barbecue. Dance a little stranger. The sound here is pop by proxy, all Sunny Delight chords and cargo shorts congeniality. It's very much in keeping with all of the latter decade snot noses, but it's somehow friendlier. It showed up to the same party as Lit and Blink-182, but it's a better dancer and it actually brought a dish to the potluck. I mean, anyone whose mom appears in their music video is someone who knows how to use a coaster. For all its poppiness, though, this is definitely a rock production by a rock band. There's something vaguely patchwork about it. You can almost hear the engineers ripping scotch tape off the dispenser to hold it together. I swear, this song was born in a lab. This was, <laughs> this, was, uh, this was forged Frankenstein, actually closer to Rocky Horror style. They genetically engineered this to be 
impossible to hate. It's like they took all of the tropes of late 90s bro bop and figured out how to give hugs with them. And this may be the only song in the history of recorded music with an unnecessary ska break in the middle that makes the song better. If you want proof of how likable this song is, it appeared on seven different Billboard charts. Seven. Talk about punching all the elevator buttons at once. It wasn't eligible for the Hot 100 because they didn't release it as a physical single, but if they had, it would be on that one too. So does that make Fly too mainstream for the alternative charts? For that matter, does it make it too mainstream for me? I mean, I do find it kind of trite and kind of floofy, but those are thin excuses for my sort of hipster contrarian dong swinging. Not winning isn't the same as losing, and this song is completely innocent of any wrongdoing. Okay, look, people, I am not made of Teflon, okay? You give me happy, I respond to happy. And this song, it's not a favorite. It's not one I choose voluntarily. It's not something that I love. But the long and short is, when it comes on, I smile a little, you know? And, and that's, that's all I need. That's, that, that is good enough for summer. Fly is something of an anomaly on the album Floored, which otherwise is a mostly punky, funky affair. Might be an odd choice for a single, but I get it. New Metal was charging in to storm the castle, so might as well throw that beach party before it gets here. You fascinate me, sir. You, no, 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 don't, don't come closer. <laughs> You're fine. Just, uh, who are you really? This is the last Perry Farrell song on this countdown, which makes it the last chance to ask ourselves, what makes this man tick? And then, when we fail to answer that, we can ask, been cut stealing? What the screaming blue Saxon fuck are you doing? This video was my first exposure to Jane's addiction because I had somehow missed Jane Said and Stop and all the other stuff. And there certainly was nothing else like it on MTV at the time. So this video would come on and I, I wouldn't change the channel. I wouldn't get hugely into it, but I'd watch it like, like watching a nature documentary, you know, something like the mating rituals of the Binturong, like... It... What? First up to the plate, we have those dog sound effects, apropos of absolutely fuck all, like the sort of avant-garde performance art that the tiny cheese plate people like to pretend they understand. And then the band comes in, bringing with them a dollop of that chill that Perry completely lacks. It's mine. Mine, oh mine. The arrangement is... Well, a bit rickety might be the word for it, held together with an Elvis pants strut and felonious monk chords on the bridge. Kind of like a popsicle stick sculpture if Dad helped out with the glue. It's more peculiar than weird, really, until you add in Perry's soprano sax with a deviated septum vocal delivery. That's the point when I turn from MTV viewer to State Highway gas station attendant. You're not from around here, are you? So the novelty of this song, at least when it was novel, it, it boosts this song up a couple points on the scoreboard. But the, the big thing that helps it, weirdly enough, is the sarcasm of it. Because Perry Farrell, his voice has a chronic case of nya nya to it, <laughs> which is really well suited to a level of sarcasm that he, his positivity doesn't usually let him use. So here's a case where he's taking that seldom used irony and he's aiming it directly at people who take whatever it is they want because he's very clearly against theft. Right? He, he is, isn't he? No? Because on the one hand, we have that key line, when I want something, I don't want to pay for it. I've never heard it put that simply before. And when you strip down a truth like that, you release all the potential energy inside. People make excuses for stealing, but most of the time it's between paying and not paying, I'd rather not pay. That sounds like a pro-stealing sentiment. But then you've got the aftermath, when we sat and laughed and waved it into the air. So it's not about want or need, but about the act itself. There's literally no point to it. That thing you stole ends up being a participation trophy. The adrenaline rush behind all that is implied, but in the end we're left with... and? 
I have trouble picking up what Jane's Addiction is laying down under the best of circumstances, but this song comes closest to actually bringing me in because all of their usual ticks and sharp angles, they come off as quirky rather than abrasive, you know. It still feels like they didn't wipe their feet on the way in the door, but I'm not kicking them out of the living room and I'm actually kind of glad they're here. Still gonna count the teaspoons after they leave. And like it or not, Ben Caught Stealing is still a needle drop for 1990 in my brain radio. There was so much music that went flying past me back then, but this one stuck, for better or worse. Nostalgia points count, and it's definitely nostalgia, not trauma. So, well played guys, you can stay. I moved out of the state of Illinois somewhere in the middle of the 90s alt-rock revolution and then spent a few years being kind of salty about how little Chicago was being talked about. Okay, yes, fine, the 90s belonged to Seattle. But while they were getting buried hip-deep in talent scouts, Chicago was busy changing alt-rock from the inside out. Wilco was hard at work being every American rock critic's prom date. Liz Fair was out Alanising Alanis before Alanis had even alanis Jesus Lizard was busy doing whatever this was. And then there was Material Issue, and there was Baruch Assault, and there was Urge Overkill. On and on and on. So we had a bunch of critics darlings and a bunch of cult favorites and some really influential names, but none of these was as famous as your average Soundgarden or Alice in Chains. Except one. And I don't know how I feel about that. Yes, it's time to talk about Billy Corgan. Billy Corgan was one of a handful of 90s alt-rockers whose ego came with its own splash zone, like a lost American cousin of the Gallagher brothers. And also like Oasis, Smashing Pumpkins started off as just good, grubby, head-down, buffalo stance college rock, until Corgan decided that his artistic footprint would be a wide one, which is when he went full tilt prog rock on everyone. And yet despite all that, their one and only number one alternative hit was 1979. It's like they were driving straight from a liberal arts gang fight to a Soho art installation, but decided to stop for soft serve on the way. 1979 is a track off of the album Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, which is the album when the band went full Emerson, Lake and Palmer prog, and everything on it in, in one way or another was kind of an aberration. So you could make the argument that the tonal swerve on this particular song was all part of the concept, but it's too guileless for that. It's too innocent. And it doesn't sound like anything else that they've done really. So why is it that this song feels like what Billy Corgan wishes he was doing all the time? This isn't a summer hit like Fly was. For one thing, it peaked in March, but mood wise, it's a lot closer to what summer actually feels like as a teenager. Once we get past that canned opening beat, the song feels like the aftermath of spinning around on a tire swing. Swoony, but with a taste of something kinetic behind it. Novocaine chords with an espresso chaser. This song has the understanding that any kid has on a 90 degree day. You can keep moving, but still take your time. 1979 is a song that moves at the speed of nostalgia. This is clearly a personal song for Billy, and that's what makes it so endearing. But you get the sense that he's not really used to this particular mode of his own personal muse yet. He usually has that rat in a cage, rolling boil energy that he brings to the session. And here he's trying to turn that down to a medium simmer. And it only kind of works, unfortunately. It's like I can feel the pace that he's setting. I feel it viscerally because it's familiar. But you just know this is not what he practiced in front of the mirror with a hairbrush microphone. The the 1979 dips into memory in a way the Smashing Pumpkins never really did again. It was never their weapon of choice, really. So in the end, that sentiment is a brush they never fully learned to paint with. But even though it's only kind of successful, I'm glad Billy decided to let us in, even if for just a few moments. Okay, indulge me a second. I have never done this before, but we're talking about Chicago bands from the 90s. The Drovers. 
Chicago 90s band, to this day, the best live band I have ever seen in my life. Go look them up. Their album, World of Monsters, in particular, uh, it's on streaming services. Give it a listen. Come back and thank me later. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for your time. On with the show. Why, 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 why do they keep getting this wrong? I would die for you. I would die for you. I've Come on, everybody, you know the words. Let's all sing along. A great band only manages one number one hit for completely the wrong song just because it appeared on a soundtrack. Or maybe because number one appears in the title, who can say? In this case, the soundtrack was Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet, so at least it wasn't a box office flop this time. Never underestimate the Leo DiCaprio effect, people. Now in the case of Garbage, I'm somewhat mollified by the fact that even their offcuts are good. But then I get all pissed off again once I'm reminded that it's a remix. A remix. Buddy, you've got some kind of nerve. See, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Garbage did not need to be remixed. Ever. Just, okay, look, look, look at this here. See, see this guy? That's Butch Vig. He's their drummer, and he's also a producer. He's their producer. He is a good producer. He has produced some other things, such as... Also, this. And also, also, this. I love sugar cane. And he also produced one other, I'm, it, I'm forgetting what it is now, just give me a second. It's, um... So no, Butch Vig and Garbage do not need your help. Who listens to this and says, this is great, but it could use some of my tweaks? No, 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 no. It's like those assholes who Photoshop Frida Kahlo paintings to take out the unibrow. And this, this again, garbage is only number one hit. I want justice. So now I'm left reviewing two things. First, what the band did, and then second, what Nellie Hooper did to it. The original number one crush was a B-side, so maybe that's why they thought it needed a little something something. The highlight, as always, is Shirley Manson, who's got a sneer in the vocals and a defiant heel twist in her delivery. A leather jacket and well drinks in audio format. The very first line of number one crush is, I would die for you. And that right there is how it ended up in a Romeo and Juliet movie. Uh, but although the content is spot on, the tone isn't. Uh, and that's where the remix comes in, because Baz Luhrmann's vision for Romeo and Juliet is all neon in excess. It needed something more lurid and uh, moist, I guess. So uh, into the studio they go for the remix, and by the time the smoke cleared, uh, Shirley Manson was no longer grinding her heel. She was grinding other things. We start, of course, with gratuitous porn effects. Actually, that's not porn. It's samples from bedtime stories by Madonna, which... Okay, maybe I was right about the porn in the first place, but either way. From there, they layer on a guitar line that they scraped from the Marianas Trench, and then top that with a bass line that was forged from pine tar and abject lust. My solar plexus says, thank you, sir. Combine all that with a basic bump and grind, and voila, Nine Inch Nails cosplay. And look, I like Nine Inch Nails, I like garbage, but they can't help but cancel each other out. The performance is still on point, but they took all the garbage out of my garbage. Garbage was easily one of the tightest bands of the era, so they were always going to score well on this no matter what, no matter what they decide to layer on top of it, because they're still at the core there. I can hear them, I can feel them. I just want them to come out. I just, I want them to, they... <sighs> this is one of those times when a great artist signed on to do something other than their forte. And do I wish they were doing what they're best at? Of course I do. But you know, frankly, it's good to hear from them at all. Yeah. 
As a matter of ethics, therapists will not take on friends and family as clients uh, because they are too close to the problem. I understand where they're coming from. Words like violence break the silence. Come Actually speaking, I know there was a time before Enjoy the Silence, but my body doesn't know that. This is a song so familiar and ingrained that picking it apart is like picking apart, I don't know, the concept of breakfast. Why bother having an opinion? This isn't something to have an opinion on, it just is. Depeche Mode's Violator is absolutely a killer album, and uh, it had quite an effect on me at the time, but Enjoy the Silence in particular is less of a song for me than it is the fact of its own existence. And trying to rank it in this thing was weird because for the first time I had to ask myself, do I actually like this song? And my answer was, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, obviously I did rank it and I think it's in the right place. It feels like it's in the right place, but I'm not entirely clear on my reasons for that. Uh, what I'm trying to say is we're gonna break out the pedantic scalpel and we're gonna start cutting now. Words are very unnecessary. We'll start with the sound, which is, well, it's Depeche Mode. They could laminate this and use it for an ID card at the bank window. There are a few bits I can do without. You know, lose some of the Cassia tone schmada, drop a few of the laser tag bird calls, the things that make it sound like a gig at the Robotron 2084 finals. Melodically, it's dead on, no complaints there, but there's something I'm having trouble pinning down. I can't help but feeling like it's a little, I don't know, lying to me. There's kind of an illusion going on here because the song feels slower than it actually is. Like the energy it's bringing is Sunday hammock techno, but there's still a drive there. Um, in filmmaking, they have this technique called a dolly zoom, where they're pulling the camera back on a track, but at the same time, the camera lens is zooming in and it creates this disorienting effect where it looks like it's simultaneously getting closer and further away at the same time, or the focal point is standing still and the rest of the world is moving. And they've kind of done an audio version of that. They somehow created anti-disco here because I simultaneously want to dance and I want to sit down. I'm at the nightclub, I'm at the Greyhound station, I'm at the combination nightclub Greyhound station. All of this is somewhat at odds with the lyrics themselves. Enjoy the Silence is openly about a quest for peace in both outer and inner calm, but they're cramming a lot of words into a tiny space for someone who's just looking for a barca lounger. Actually, that's too crass for this song. We're looking at another example of that secular spirituality. It's a Sunday morning hymn for those whose Sunday mornings aren't about church, but about post-rave recovery. Seeking not God specifically, but the cool morning air and maybe a banana nut muffin. So I've now spent several minutes teasing apart the threads on this, and I still haven't gotten around to saying whether I like the song or not. And that's because I still don't know, you know, after all this time. I do know that there's a kernel of something really profound at the center of it, and I know that there's a lovely cocoon of sound around it, but this song is so much part of the landscape for me. I can't get enough inertia on it to either start loving it or start hating it. I mean, it takes energy to do either of those things, and it's not giving me that energy. So I guess kind of in the middle is where it goes. It is what it is at the end of the day. Something good, something appreciated, but it doesn't climb quite as high as it wants to. Still, I'll enjoy it while it's playing, and then when it's done playing and the silence comes in, I'll enjoy that too. Enjoy the silence. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here to change the world. Any minute now. Nineteen ninety one, man. That transition into the edgy 90s was like a banner flailing in a hurricane. A period of time when the capital N next capital T thing felt impossible to predict. Everything was all possibility and no limitation. Jesus Jones seemed to know that and they welcomed the coming whatever. What I'm unsure of is when the whatever did come, did they know their place in it? 
So this should surprise none of you. I have a massive, massive Spotify playlist that I put together of 90s alternative that I listen to a lot. And most of the songs that I listen to regularly now feel at least partly current because, you know, why shouldn't it? I just listened to it last week. But there's a couple songs in there that even after all this time, even after dozens and dozens of listens, they still feel like push pins in the calendar, like my brain gets dropped right in that time. Right here, right now is one of those because it comes on and I can picture that living room, those friends, that conversation I was having when it came on. And that means I have another problem because this is yet another song when I don't know if I can get enough distance to determine whether it's good or not, and worse yet, why. Right here, right now, the, world the sound alone is 1991 packed into a peel top soup for one can. Every element of the production tells you something about the people making it. The opening production blurb? Hey, we're fun-loving. The vocal rasp of the lead singer? Hey, we smoke unfiltered. The horn section? Hey, we hang out in Manchester. The loop-the-loop -loop bass? Hey, we're on drugs. And most importantly, the lyrics? Hey, we're serious. And or really wish it was the 60s again because that was no small thing. For those of us who had been raised on boomer stories about Haight Ashbury and Woodstock, for a hot minute back there, it felt like we might get a 60s of our own. The song was inspired by news events coming out of Europe at the time. Uh, the US was still wallowing in the ashtray of stale Reaganomics at the time, but uh, in Europe we had things like the fall of the Berlin Wall and Perestroika and the Romanian Revolution. And to a lot of people, it felt like there was something building out of that. And you can see it in a bunch of songs from the time, late 80s, early 90s. Some of them taking it fairly seriously and some of them taking it fairly not. And to a lot of people, Jesus Jones included, it seemed like we were finally going to get our 60s, that that youth energy and activism was actually going to kick in. And looking back at that now, there's something kind of innocent about that feeling. And that's kind of charming, and it's kind of sad. Right here, right now, there, is no there are plenty of songs from that time that are dated in sound, but this is a song that's dated in content. Their kind of positivity is evergreen, but watching the world wake up from history, in retrospect, it feels more naive than anything. Like they're leaning into a cultural sea change that just wasn't coming. Listening to Right Here, Right Now is like reading an old love letter. You come to it with warmth for the person you used to be, but also the knowledge that you'll never be that person again. By its very definition, nostalgia is something experienced after you've moved on. It's something you're looking back toward. And sometimes that means that you've evolved to a place that the place you were in your life back then no longer completely makes sense to you. You can tap into it to some degree, but you don't understand the why of it anymore. Nostalgia is a good chunk of why this song is as high on the list as it is. And nostalgia is a good chunk of the reason why it isn't any higher. And there you have it, the end of yet another episode. Thank you, as always, for spending time with me. Uh, if you liked what you saw, please click that like button. If you want to see more, please click that subscribe button. Uh, they seem like small things, but they really do help us out. They bring more eyeballs to these videos. And I thank you in advance. Thank you also for any comments you leave. I always love to hear from you guys. Uh, the next episode of this, uh, it will be autumn, which means I will be a much happier and better relaxed hopefully less sweaty man, <laughs> uh, but I hope the end of your summer is going very well. And I hope all was well with you and yours. And until next time, in the words of Depeche Mode. Enjoy the silence. These things, oh, I'm doing weird things with my hands again. Voguing for YouTube. Uh, <laughs>
This is a long filming. <clears throat> well, one of those takes won't suck, I hope.